right? When you're reversing your car, are you thinking, okay, it's time to, probably when you were younger and you were learning how to drive, you were thinking around, around those lines, but now you just do it. You just go, you go to work, you're all, you're in that zone. Um, and one of the things that you need to think about was how the habits of how we used to recruit STEM and any kind of technical talent has had to change um, over the past couple of years. Um, one of the things we keep noticing is that the pool keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Less women are graduating with technical careers, less diverse candidates are graduating with technical careers, but as you know, our aspirational goals do what? Higher and higher. You, can, you show your manager, there's only two people in the country with this particular skill set, but you want to hire five, right? So that's the world we live in now. Um, and I tell you this, five or six years ago, we may not have even thought of hosting an event like this with our competitors in the room, right, for the space. But that's, those are some of the habits we have to change to be able to get to that next level recruiting individually. So just know that while you are in our home, uh, we welcome you here. Some of my team is here as well to learn from you, and they're going to offer as much of what they're doing as well to, to, to offer to you and what you're doing um, in your recruiting efforts. But completely open-minded and really excited to have you guys here because you're all kind of in the same game as we are trying to distinguish yourselves uh, with college talent, specifically in the STEM area. Uh, so with that, I'm going to give the baton back to uh, Andrea and uh, the team and, you know, have a great day. Uh, we're all here, obviously, to answer any questions about what we're doing, but we're really excited to partner with you and collaborate on how we can find the right people. Good. No one outrage? <laughs> and um, you know, I think I was so excited. I was remiss in doing a couple of things. I want you all to kind of look at the back, and that is Stephen Rothberg, who <laughs> is the president and founder of College Recruiter. So I'm um, really excited to have Stephen with us, and also off to I don't know. Some of you in front of you, but the table in the back, that's Grace Palmer, and she's the client services representative for College Recruiter, and real happy to have Grace with us as well. Um, again, kind of to piggyback on what Judith said, an event like this really is a great way um, to kind of hear what others are doing to generate ideas that you can have some takeaways that you can take back to your organizations to kind of implement. It's a great way to benchmark about kind of what you're doing against what other people are doing. So I just really find these type of forms to be really engaging and just a great place to kind of learn and, and kind of share kind of what's going on and share your pain points and, you know, your challenges and to get encouragement to realize you're not alone. Right? I'm not the only one struggling with this at night. And um, to hear what others have to say. So as we begin to kind of, we're going to talk about three major topics today. Um, defining what diverse STEM recent graduates or students are best for your organization. Um, create a strategy and tactics for finding and engaging with those candidates. And the third subject area is going to be hiring and retaining the best diverse STEM candidates. So those are going to be our three subject areas of discussion today. Kind of how the day is going to flow, we're going to have a um, discussion for about 45 minutes. We're going to take a 15 minute break reconvene with the next subject area, um, and we will conclude our day by 4 p.m. Eastern, right? Um, also, because we're streaming live, um, every time we come back, I'm going to do kind of an intro, so just bear with me, okay? You're like, I heard that in the beginning, but because we're streaming live and people will be able to view this, I'm at a later point, we want them to know what they're viewing, okay? Y'all with me? We okay? Yeah. All yeah. right. Okay. So from now until 2 p.m., we're going to discuss our first topic, which is defining what diverse STEM recent graduate and students are best for your organization. And I think we could really just open that up and, you know, anybody can jump in. So I'm going to, um, I want to see, I want to pick on somebody, anybody, let me see. No, I'm, I'm going to let you do it first. How does your organization define what um, is a diverse STEM candidate? How do you define that? And what, what, is, who, what is this profile like that's best for your organization? Who wants to tackle that first? Who's Jennifer? Tracy. Who's Tracy? Tracy, you want to share for me? Sure. Thanks. Um, so I work for Air Products. We're a chemical company, and um, we hire mostly chemical mechanical engineers. 
um, a few IT folks, but most, primarily the engineers. And um, for us, we hire across from bachelor's, master's, and PhD because we have technology uh, needs as well. Um, so how do we define, I mean, for us, the, the minimum criteria for us is 3.0 GPA and higher. And um, we, we have a pretty healthy internship program that feeds into our, um, we call it career development program with a, a multi-year rotational tech program. So we try to pull our full-time hire through from our intern program. And um, we, we're pretty successful at doing that. Um, we have target schools that we go to, and we, you know, partner with some of the diverse organizations as well, and some of the um, employee groups at the schools. And that's, that's kind of where we start. So Jim Albrecht, I work for Selective Insurance Company up in Branchville, New Jersey, and um, we're a property casualty organization for both commercial and personal lines. So for us, for the STEM students we need, we need uh, actuaries. So we're looking at mathematics majors. Um, typically undergrad, but masters will feed as well. We have a robust internship program. In fact, our interns started just today. About 35 of them are in our, our corporate location. Um, so there's an opportunity to rotate through actuarial, um, finance, and so forth, and it'd be picked up by the organization. The other students we look for would be the engineering students for what we call our safety management program. And this is traditionally an industry called risk control or loss control. But these are the ones that go out and look at the accounts um, with the underwriters, determine acceptability of the risk, price the risk, uh, advise the clients of what could be a safer work environment to mitigate or minimize or, in a perfect world, eliminate losses, which we know will never happen. But they are an integral part of the underwriting team. and. While the industry has gotten away from the engineering side because it becomes more client advisory and a communications individual, some of our managers are a little bit more old school and they look for the traditional profile, which is a pure engineering or ergonomics type of, uh, of student. So we're still looking for a lot of those engineering types throughout the country. Mm -hmm. So, Mom. My name is Lisa Potter. I work for McGraw Hill Financial. I do global campus recruiting. So, um, STEM in the financial services world is uh, the definition is different than uh, other companies I've worked at, in the sense that um, we we would hire mostly STEMs for IT software development jobs. And as you know, a major challenge with that is um, I would say 85% of our applicants are international students which become very uh, difficult when, when you have a visa quota to, to work with. Um, we have a, on the, on the S&P, Standard and Poor rating side, you know, they would be open to hiring STEM students for the ratings business. Um, the challenge with that is they don't consider uh, really Asians as diverse in our population because 60% of our candidates are Asian descent. So the biggest uh, need and necessity is African American students and Hispanic students, which really challenging. Like every year, just if we could barely get 10 people through the through the pipeline, we consider we're doing very well. So um, that that's sort of the definition that we have to work with, even though legally it's not the definition that we have to comply with EEO, um, but it's a standard we have to set for ourselves. And thank you for defining it that way, um, Lisa. I know um, in reading um, some surveys, um, just how you're defining it, um, female, mm -hmm. African American, Hispanic tends to be what most organizations, when they're looking at targeting diversity, that's what they're looking at. It's going to be those criteria. Um, anybody else going to share that or anything around what they're doing or how they define it? Come on, Jennifer. <laughs> Well, I think I would say it's just a matter of like really differentiating how you would attract that talent on, on campus and externally. I think sometimes you have to wear their, the, the college student hat and think about where they hang out on campus as far as identifying, you know, where to identify that talent um, across the board. Uh, 
because I think sometimes it takes too much, you know, this volume of the different diversity of populations to attract, but sometimes we forget we have to take a step back and think about where are the students, what do they want, and how can we do things a little bit differently for that population based on what their interests are. So maybe it's not always a career fair um, all the time. Maybe it's doing different things that they like to do on campus, whether it's some kind of program or some kind of, you know, big event that happens on campus for those students and seeing having those kind of those kind of things. So I think it's really about knowing the population and their interests in life and really really to help them understand what your organization brings to the table and you know what's it what's in it for them. Horizon to our STEM for us we're recruiting into IT as well, right? So that big group of people that are graduating with a computer science major, um, some kind of, they know how to program languages, that's gonna be a big bucket. Um, our network engineering um, also requires working for computer engineering majors as well. Um, then we still have a bit of the STEM too with, where there's a math interest there because we do hire database analysts. So there's, we literally are going after almost all segments in that talent pool. And then one piece for us at least that we struggle in is gonna be around location. Um, so you know we are, even though we're on an hour away from a major metropolitan city, most students that at least we're encountering on big campuses wanna be in these huge sexy cities, right? At San Francisco, a New York City, and Basking Ridge somehow fails. <laughs> 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 So just to answer your question and to piggyback on what Jen's saying, most of us I think are looking for all segments of that group um, and for us especially we have a new product organization where we're asking people to come in with an engineering, a bit of a creative innovation, marketing mindset. I mean we're, we're basically asking the schools to produce magic for us um, and that's where well, we're struggling as well. And I think someone just kind of shared it, just, just the whole, when you start talking about it, um, um, you talked about it when, in your introduction and your welcome. The candidate pool is so shrinking when you're talking about the diverse, you know, uh, the, first of all, just diverse candidates in general, right? Because um, I, I just know I have heard employers say, we want the best and the brightest, we want the top 10%, we want the 3.0, right, student, and so that's gonna narrow your pool right from the beginning. Then when you start talking about um, the STEM disciplines, now you're talking a smaller portion. Forget about that 10%. So then this is going back, and I was really trying to find it, and I couldn't get a real current number, but I'm gonna use this for argument's sake. Um, I'm gonna say this might have been maybe back in, I don't know, 2011, 2012. Um, the number of diverse candidates, no, STEM candidates, not even diverse, was something crazy like 86,000, right? So if you're saying I wanna recruit the top 10%, you're only talking 8,600. And forget about when you start, uh, I'm sorry, that was engineering, not total STEM, engineering. But still, 8,600 engineering students total. And when you start segmenting that out between like your EE, -E, your Chem E, M E, but how many students are you really talking about? And everybody's trying to compete with that same for that same candidate, like crazy, right? Seems like everybody's on that um, that mm -hmm. right? And who who can do it? Who can do it best? Who can do it the most? Um, I remember um, I'm going to keep the company anonymous and it was in this type of forum, and the VP um, asked the question, is there anything new? And the answer was no. There really isn't this magic bullet, but it really is about who does it the most and who does it best, right? Hitting that candidate like multiple times. Go ahead. I'm gonna add to, uh, to everybody's comments here, also in channeling the interests of potential candidates, right? So. You have in different categories, you know, software developer, does that person really enjoy coding, for instance, right? And <clears throat> does that person want to give back to, let's say, the healthcare community by way of his technical skills as compared to working for Google? Mm -hmm. You know, what we have found with some of our customers is that um, Google's not as uh, attractive, attractive to some candidates because they're more interested in working in the healthcare environment 
and using their technical skills. So not only their technical passion, but their industry passion. And you know, the retention rate uh, gets up and <coughs> increases significantly. Well, you know, you kind of, um, and I'm gonna kind of piggyback that question, which kind of, um, I don't know who sent who, who wrote this question, but it really was like what really, really motivates the STEM diverse candidate. So like what is the motivation factor? And I guess how do you commute and that was another question, how do you communicate that? Because what I heard you say is not sometimes it's about that company, that sexy company, and I want to do that. And other times it really is about passion and what drives them as an individual. So how do you communicate that? Or how are you getting your messaging? Um, out there about your organization that taps into that student's passion? Well, that's, a, that's a great question. You know, in some of our um, interviewing processes, multi-step interviewing processes, some of the questions that we ask from a behavioral interview, interview perspective talk about just letting that, you know, asking a question and letting that person talk. You know, what are your passions? How did you get into this? You know, why did you get into technology? Um, and you, you'll hear folks say, candidates will come back and they'll say, well, you know what, my dad was a computer programmer, or my dad is a computer programmer, or well, you know what, my dad was a computer programmer, but I really got interested in some of the computers he had. You know, you go back to the Commodore 64, you go back to, you know, the Mac 2E, or things of that nature, and I just yeah. took, a, I took a very genuine interest in it. And uh, then we also ask questions about, well, you know, why would you want to work in the healthcare industry, for instance, instead of Google. I mean, everybody wants to Google. Everybody wants to work for Google and, you know, Silicon Valley. Why would you want to work for, you know, a healthcare company? And some of the answers that came back were, you know, my family member was in the hospital and, you know, they were dying and I saw all the different computers that were being brought in, computers on wheels, for instance, and the different machines they were being hooked up to. And I knew there was a technology aspect to that delivery of that healthcare. So if I can give back to the healthcare community by using my technical skills, that's what I want to do. That's why I don't want to work at Google. That's why I want to work at this company. And those people were very successful in the program. And the people that answer, well, you know, this is this seems like a great opportunity, but you know, Google is kind of sexy and you know, I may <laughs> if they do if they do come calling, I may think twice about, you know, staying or going. So you know, you gotta walk away from those types of comments. You know, if it's a great point though yeah. at being able to identify those differentiators in your pool. Right. You know, whether someone really wants to work for you or they're just I remember once this is millennia ago where I had a campus person somebody was practicing on your company. So I, I love that though, like just being able to explore more and probably thinking, all of us, probably to think better about what kind of questions we're asking, right? To get to that. Are they really interested in working in your industry or are they just practicing? Kicking the tires. <laughs> I think one thing too is to be just to be back off with Jen and also is to kind of be proactive instead of reactive. You know, when we're on these campuses and we're speaking to these students, putting on the student hat and asking them. What are some things that interest you? What are some things that you're that you like to do outside of even you know being in school? What are some of the ad hoc things you like to do? And then being able to relate that back to the company and say, oh, you like green initiatives? Well, let me tell you what our company does in this space. So something that will get the student thinking about, you know what, I really want to apply, to get them to apply, and to get them to be kind of open to, you know, this company might be what I'm looking to do. You know, so I think they, you know when you're on those campuses, just kind of asking those questions to kind of determine what the interests are of the students and then be able to relate that back to what the company does. Yeah, I agree. I, I feel like these conversations can be had in every phase of the interview process when you're first engaging up into your behavioral interview when you're seriously considering them. I, I think a major distinguisher is to truly show um, a, a sincere care for what we can offer them, but also what they can offer us and to learn about who they are because my challenge is I have a very diverse client group across the country, and a lot of them want that, that certain bucket, that CV or that EV in, in, in this area only. And they get really focused on that, and they kind of lose sight of who the actual person is or who might be uh, potentially joining their team. So the more you learn about the student, what their passions are, they might have a electrical engineering background, 
but they might be also able to handle responsibilities outside of what the um, fundamental elements of that, that degree are. And what better way to try than to get in front of that team to show them what their true passion are, is, excuse me, and then they can contribute. Not only do they contribute because they have to build a resume or experience, but they contribute because they're really invested into what that team is doing. So it allows me to move my buckets around strategically so that I have cans that might not fit the typical profile that I'm actually looking for, but I know them enough to really at least get their foot in the door and let them sell themselves at that point too. So it's really understanding more than just what you see on the resume of that first two minutes where you're, you're talking to a career fair or a preliminary screen. But also, I think the recruiting starts a lot earlier than, than before. Like they get branded with all these social media and they get bombarded way early. So it's not just when they're ready to graduate like previously 10 years ago. Yeah. We used to target them when they're ready to graduate. Now we target them. And they the technology and then they start falling. Really. So. Maybe we should take the hospitals in the pregnancy. <laughs> 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 so, and I think there's a, there's a lot of people that the recruiting, uh, STEM recruiting for a manufacturing company, right? So different type of engineering. I, I do make the distinction between different type of STEM and how challenging it is. I, I actually think getting female is, is one of the easier, the easier, um, you know, statistic to, metrics to meet. Uh, if, if you look at purely the demographic stats for some of the STEM schools or the engineering school, you know, they're close to 40 to 50 percent. There are some of the schools, it's 40 to 50 percent female. So it's fairly easy. That the challenge for most, most organizations 10 years into their career, when they're in the childbearing age, companies are not have policies that set up for them to be successful staying in the workforce. That's when you see a tremendous drop. And when you get to the executive level, you have like a 10% population to go after, right? So I actually think female is actually one of the easiest ones. So looking at for hiring for mechanic, mechanical engineers, MEs, and chemies, chemies actually, most of them have a hard time finding jobs. There are actually uh, a lot of them uh, available. MEs are also flooded. Um, EEs are getting harder, in, in, in my opinion, because some of the EEs, they, they do a lot of uh, programming in school. So then they get poached for software development. So especially now, <laughs> doing what I'm doing, what focus only on software programmers, I find that is the most difficult major to find uh, out of all the stands. And then to, to then make it even more niche to say, focus on African Americans and Hispanics, that's even even more challenging. And and kind of to what everybody's saying, you have to go earlier, right? Um, you know, so my last time we were talking about location, so mm -hmm. manufacturing was not very sexy. We used to get, you know, the reason was, oh, okay, people did not want to come with us because of, you know, we're in Marinette, Wisconsin, North of Texas. But reality is that was actually easier. I'm working in New York City now. They're like, we can't afford New York City. We actually get more rejection right now than when I used to work for Tyco. I mean, it's just we could fill those jobs easily, and and so you know the the cost of living comparison. Like a lot of the engineering students, they love um, you know to be part of the the world where they can actually touch the mechanics and be in that environment. Um, so it's much easier to sell than just working for. Um, like a financial service company would just go in and every cube would look the same, but you're actually doing different products. Mm -hmm. um, so, so um, I mean, I, I think location is, uh, you know, now I'm beginning to think it's kind of arbitrary. You sell whatever you, you sell, you know, whatever you have to offer. And the best line defense is with the hiring manager. I, I find that, you know, we have to educate our hiring manager, right, to say, you can't get somebody who's junior and who had interned elsewhere before because they may not be interested in your job, right? They, they want to go work for Google because they've been building resumes up. So you've got to take somebody who's a sophomore, who show potential, they have a landscape business on the side, but they show entrepreneurship, and they, they show that they can self-initiate. And that's the kind of thing you look for, and then you build on that. So. Well, just a couple things, and I just really want to share a whole lot. But let me ask this question, and I want to piggyback. Um, I can't see on the way to there, but um, Sam. Was, yeah. say that again. Sam. Sam. Yeah. Okay, and actually, that was one of the questions I wanted to ask. And you talked about um, really kind of recruiting and targeting those candidates earlier. Who, by show of hands, who has like a let's start with the high school initiative? 
I'm an SAIC, so we're a government contracting company and defense contractor in IT and engineering. Okay, so you guys have high school initiatives. Anybody yes. doing anything in middle school? Our foundation is. Yeah, our foundation is. Our foundation is. And again, remember the brand. So it's like when, yes. you, when you're, if you're top, if you're fortune 50 and above, most of the time your foundation will kind of do some of that work for you in the back end, thank God. Um, but yeah, our foundation is middle school, elementary school. I mean, well, I just, again, I want to hear kind of some kind of yeah. some of the things that may be going on. I just want to share with you, right? I remember doing a roundtable before. It was a transportation company. Um, I'm going to leave their location and everything anonymous. And they actually had an initiative of really kind of growing their own talent. And because it was so competitive, the STEM discipline that disciplines, I'm going to say plural, that they work with um, high school students. And if the high school student was willing to stay with them upon graduation from college, they actually paid for their college education. And then I, you know, I don't know if it was three years or five years on the back end, but you know, engaging them early, getting them excited, and again, transportation. You know, you might think, you know, bus driver, train conductor, but you're not talking about the infrastructure and all that goes into, um, you know. In ter as it relates to transportation. So I just thought that that was kind of interesting in engaging them early, getting them excited about it, right? And um, saying, well, if you commit to us, this is our commitment to you. And if you do well, right, then this is our commitment when you finish. So I thought that was an interesting strategy. Anyone want to share kind of what you're doing around your high school um, initiatives? And I'm just curious, anybody could share, share some stats, like what's the ultimate retention uh, when, it, when it gets to converting to full time? When you start investing in high school, if you have any stats, that would be great. I don't think our partnership has been long enough to have them get to the graduation rate of graduating yeah. college. So I think that's, that's, you know, both for us, any attraction touch point for us is important. So even if it's you were a high school intern and you go off to University of Michigan and you tell your roommate, hey, I did an internship at Verizon and Engineering, and that roommate thinks, oh, Verizon never thought about engineering. To me, it's worth it, um, just to have that additional attraction touch point. Um, but we don't have stats yet, unfortunately. I see, I see, so you had a high school initiative. Yeah, so, yeah, so ours is new too, so we don't, of course we don't have stats, but um, some of the public schools have a technical expo, and we help we want to sponsor those. We're not sponsoring them yet, but we provide some of our business managers that come down and be judges for, for those expos and uh, for certain categories like Java programming or engineering. And we'll have just some of our materials there. It's just more of an awareness so students can understand what SCIC, who SCIC is and what we do. So just kind of a marketing um, strategy there. And then um, in some locations, um, some schools have a program where high school students, when they graduate, they have an AA degree in STEM related fields. So we've sponsored some students there. And when they, when they graduate high school, they already have their AA degree. So we uh, look for those type of programs that get involved there as well. I'm going to throw out a couple stats that I saw. Um, female, STEM, female students in Delaware are 40% more likely to be interested in chemistry majors and careers. Um, Female students in Washington, D.C. are twice, almost twice as likely to show an interest in math and statistics, um, or um, math and statistics major or career than female students nationally. Um, male students in California are significantly less likely than students nationally to be interested in STEM. But this disparity is close to slowly decreasing. African American students in Alabama are 40% more likely than African American students nationally to be interested in engineering overall. And um, the last one I'm just going to say, and again, we're talking about the shrinking pool, is um, students with STEM interests are nearly twice as likely to be interested in attending a vocational or technical college compared to students without STEM interests. So do any of you um, have any initiatives around like, the two-year college at all? 
let's see. I don't know. We kind of maybe answered this question. Um, how to be an attractive career option for STEM graduates? This is funny. They're all anonymous. So I'm just kind of looking around. Okay. Chris. Um, I work for NFI Industries, private company, um, national company. But I'm a one man show that comes from a college recruiting initiative. So we're, we're very small case compared to even lower quality companies. And we're pretty much resurrect, kind of resurrecting um, our intern program and entry level you know, graduates from kind of the current stage. So we're really at a very foundational kind of level. So I'm really interested in, because we as a whole, as a company, are looking for you know, industrial engineers, um, a variety of different IT graduates. And our company has recently been open to it. Um, you know, we, we didn't always hire you know, we didn't always hire entry level, but because we're experiencing such exponentially high growth, we, we were kind of forced to you know, bring on you know, individuals right out of college and kind of groom them and train them ground level so that way we have uh, a robust talent pool that kind of plug in when you know, promotions and high responsibility type roles are on board. So I'm really intrigued on, on how to just become that more uh, attractive option you know, to T7 recruits when they have a lot of options when every company is buying for, you know, for their bigger talents. I have an idea. So larger companies have not come to talking with students and their experiences from prior internships and even on company Verizon itself. A lot of our internship roles are not as dynamic or not as impactful as you may want, a student may want it to be. You know, they want put their thumbprint on a, on a project or <clears throat> something that could provide recognition and make them feel proud about what they do and they can take it with them to develop and grow their career. I think that could be an opportunity for a, a, a private company or a smaller company because you can create roles that have more impact or scope at a higher level where you have your senior leaders really recognize that effort so that when they're getting closer to graduation, they have a clear understanding of how they can make an impact in your company's bottom line. As opposed to some of our projects, some of the some of the feedback that I've got from our interns is that they don't really see the, the fruits of their labor or the whole, overall where the effort's done and how it really changed the business. Because at the end of the day, it seems like uh, it, it's one of those standards out there. You know, they want to make a difference. That, that it kind of is the initial point that drives them into a technical kind of study <coughs> is how they can make something that's already good even better. That could be an advantage. I remember actually, I think it was last summer or something before, we had an intern that actually got a patent in his name while working with Brighton. So uh, it's just not really about giving them that management of something to say. They owned something in some capacity. Uh, and most recently we had our meeting with Universum, and Universum provides you know, uh, the survey feedback of students and what they're interested in. And I think the biggest takeaway that we, that we saw was that they really want to know what their career path would look like at your company. So like even after thinking, okay, what would it, an IT career path look like for a student in the future? So you can go either very technical track or you can go a managerial technical track. So allowing them to see what how their career would look like at your company, I think would be something to allow you to differentiate yourself or any potential candidate to say, I can see myself working at that company because they are giving me what my career path may or may not look like, or these are the opportunities where I can actually grow my career <coughs> and things like that. So I think that's another really good way of kind of thing in a different perspective for the students to be interested in their position. Yeah, that's one of um, I think this, this summer we hired, I hired um, about 15 interns, so a small pool, and those 15 interns are kind of spread out, you know, two, two engineers, uh, five, you know, IT, you know, majors, and so one of the things that I really stressed the hiring manager was, you know, let's, let's provide a really quality experience for these interns because we don't want to just bring an intern on and you know, have them you know, get coffee and do you know, menial kind of tasks. We try to kind of almost give them a snapshot of, of hey, this is a career opportunity that you can have with NFI you know, two years down the line, five years down the line. So you want to make you know, NFI kind of like that number one, number two option you know, when they do graduate. So something that hopefully that catches on the kind of six weeks. Are you, is it intent after the um, internship experience this summer that you're going to work? That, 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 that's the goal. Um, we were lucky enough, I actually have three interns that, that came back who interned last year. 
So whatever we did last year stuck. Um, and a lot, a lot of those interns are, are niche for what we're looking for. They're not, they're not STEM uh, recruits. They're more supply chain majors, which is what we're looking for. But it's still a small thing. Uh, Chris, those are some. Of, those will be some of your greatest ambassadors as well. Ultimately, because we had them last summer, we're back again this summer. They're going to be great people to go out and talk on campus. No one better than people who have actually done the job, been there, involved in the role, lived it day to day. They had the opportunity to interview you for 12 weeks, and they interviewed you for that 12 weeks and decided, hey, I love it here. As a result, I'm coming back again. I would definitely encourage you as you look into your fall recruiting season and from here to four, start using them as your mouthpieces. Because, you know, we all know word of mouth works phenomenally well, right? That's how we do everything. Word of mouth. When you go to your dentist because of word of mouth, or your orthodontist, or whomever, um, your plumber, so on and so forth. So I think this is definitely an opportunity that you can capitalize on as well. Great, Cassandra, because, right, I'm going to piggyback on just what she said, right? They should be, at your, if you're going on campus, they should be at your rooms. They should be, you know, working mm -hmm. with you to set up, like, you know, your info sessions or networking night, right? You, they can't say it any, they can say it better than you. Mm -hmm. And but make sure you're wearing your gear. <laughs> Make sure they have your t-shirts on, yeah. the sweatshirt, the cap, the cuff, whatever you need to have them have. Or maybe even give them stuff to hand out. I've been in my past life, I've done things where that's exactly what we've done. We sent interns packages on campus with 100 t-shirts, flyers, all kinds of stuff. And we had them give it out at their club meetings. They're eyes and ears on campus. So if you really want to know where the diverse students are hanging out, you probably ask them, they're going to tell you where they're hanging out. And the clubs are a good way to recruit that. Okay, I have a challenge for that last comment, but I'll save that for the end. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to phrase this question um, and, and, and keep it around the diverse candidates. So the question would be how do other companies determine the rankings? of their core school selection as it relates to diversity recruiting or the recruiting diverse candidates. Sorry, say that again. Yeah. How do other companies determine the rankings of their core schools around, I'm going to say around um, their diversity recruiting? Overall production or percentage higher based on school. There's some clarification with that question. Yeah. The question around, I want to wrote it. <laughs> what is the heart of the question? What's the goal here? How do you set up your your yeah, How do you do yeah, the schools? How do the companies do that? Yeah. How do other companies <laughs> determine the rankings? Yeah. How do you find the top thirty schools based on the first year? How would drive? How do you select the their top thirty schools? Like, how would we do it? I, I, think, uh, number one. I think about okay, so at Verizon we um, we have a, a scorecard for all the schools that we have and there's a couple different things. We look at um, the location, uh, so geographically how close they are to some of our key hubs where we're hiring. Uh, we look at the graduation rate in the different disciplines. So in our areas where we have the what so in our areas where we're focusing on more STEM-related talent, we want to know what that graduation rate looks like in comparison to the university. And from that, what that diversity breakdown looks like. Because universities do offer that, that information that publicly, so you can easily look that up. And we also look at, from a tiering perspective, if a particular school can provide us uh, majors from one or multiple business units. So for example, a Rutgers will be any, pretty much any program at Verizon. Uh, and then JIT might only really fit our IT and engineering needs. So those are some of the elements like geography, the number of diverse high, the diverse graduation <coughs> rates within their respective majors. What else can I cover? Conversion rate. Conversion rate. We do look at. Um, we do see that we've had sometimes some schools just have, we do much better from a conversion perspective. That's another angle of it. I don't have my scorecard in front of me. I can't. There's another thing I can think of, but we do look at the, the number of diverse graduates within the respective programs to make sure that we're not putting ourselves, we're not attending a school that's not going to help yield at least some diverse numbers. But it's not the sole factor in our scorecard building and how we tier our schools. I'm sorry, I'm building the HBC. That's not including our HBC. <coughs> correct. 
question, and I know I saw that question, but I think I put it in a, the next bucket. But they, that was a question, definitely. Um, so I don't know if we answered that question for the person who asked that question, but that was the question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next one. Um, and I'm, when we, um, at the conclusion, I'm going to send an email tomorrow. Y'all going to stay within 48 hours, right? And I'm going to have like some um, links to some resources and things like that. And um, one thing that um, I, I'm, I'm going to pitch right here, I think is really cool, is we um, have just come out with what we call the Hidden Gem Awards. And the Hidden Gem Awards um, are schools that you may not think about going to. Right, because sometimes, um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna use HBCUs as an example. Um, I have talked to employers, or a lot of employers, and you will certainly hear typically the bad five, right, mm -hmm. is where everybody recruits, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then when you look at HBCUs in general, it's typically only 15 of 105, mm -hmm. right? And when you start looking at um, African American, recruiting African American diverse engineering students, there are actually nine. But of that list of nine, they all, typically you'll hear from employers it's only two. So, but what the Hidden Gem Awards is really going to get you to think about, depending upon um, the discipline, schools that you may not recognize. So, again, in my follow up, I'm going to send the link and take a look at the list. Right, uh, I'm really, um, you know, kudos to our president and founder for coming up with that concept. Because again, in talking with the employers, it will typically be like this list of schools. Well, if you're going there, probably a zillion other people are going in. So you're all trying to compete for the same candidates, but if you just broaden your view just a little bit, you're like, wow, look at some schools. Hadn't even thought of it. Never thought about you know, X, Y, Z. So again, that's going to be kind of like my resource link to you when I said my problem. Okay, I let, digress. Let, let, me, let me throw in just a little bit, a, a little addition. The, the thing that was different about these, about the Hidden Gem Awards that we just announced is that it's not just the schools where, where there are good candidates, but it's also where employers are going to be able to hire them. Because even today, there are students available, right? Like MIT is a fantastic <coughs> school. Very competitive to get into great candidates coming out of there, and you're not going to hire any one of them if you go on campus right now. But if you need people now because your company just landed a big new contract or your hiring manager thought the calendar said 2014 rather than 2015, um, you can go to these campuses and you're going to get really good talent today. Dropouts 
wouldn't be much. Anybody want to elaborate on that? Whoever wrote that? Okay, since you don't want to do that, let me read the question again. Where can we get diverse skill sets and areas in the country where the dropouts wouldn't be much? I don't know, that might we might have kind of answered that, just recruit locally, right? Again, I think where the location of where you're hiring or the need is. I don't know, anybody want to add to that? I think you made a good point where you talk about recruiting locally. One of the things that one of the areas I support in the Midwest is that in the last two years they had academies come out from the coast or from all these schools that are not local to them and they invest time and resources into them and they're able to contribute and then as they got closer to graduation, they didn't want to come back out for full time and because of those pains that they've experienced, now we're kind of bound to recruit locally in those areas, which is good and bad. It's good because it's less of a challenge for conversion, but it, it could be a little bit uh, it could be bad because there might not be talent in that area. So you, you do want to walk that line of recruiting locally, but you also have to not, you can't always limit yourself either. So the little pockets, obviously, statistically, the more you read, they're all across the entire country in certain areas. So you have to have some sort of uh, strategy to, to and your recruiting process and your interview process has to be sound enough that you know you're getting a commitment when, when the student is going to accept an internship opportunity for if you have long term aspirations to convert that, especially for yourself. How many, uh, what, how, by show of hands, how many organizations have a military industry? All right, we'll go on this side. Who cares to share about their military initiative, kind of what you're doing? I can't see Courtney. Um, we have, um, it's only local to Minnesota right now. Um, our work for United Health Group, we're um, based out of Minneapolis. So uh, we only have one recruiter doing it right now for the entire country, but it is pretty localized to Minnesota right now. Um, we have planning next week to expand our diversity recruiting, which is why they sent me here. Um, we do a lot of different programs, but the military environment is um, one of our fastest growing that we're really trying to, to impact um, for our next recruiting season. I, now there were more hands than that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> One colleague. Um, I work for American Express. This is our first year really having a, a veteran. <coughs> um, we don't have any set quotas or targets, but something we did this year is we had an on-site event where we invited different veterans from the local schools of the NYU, Columbia, um, schools within New York City. They came on site and heard from senior leaders who were also vets with American Express, and we also had the recruitment team come in and help them to kind of reformat their resumes so that they were readable to the general audience and making sure that it wasn't so military specific that the general person couldn't understand kind of what their skill set was. But something that we've been doing is to kind of get our kind of brand out there to, to the veteran community and also just partnering with different veteran groups on campuses. So we had a, uh, it was called Coles uh, in, in the Tampa marketplace, and uh, we had a networking initiative, uh, you know, from a, from a large contract win. So we went out to a couple of the industry events, uh, some of the specific uh, job boards, for instance, host, you know, veterans only type of uh, career fairs, for instance. So we combine that with you know an online presence, marketing, advertising, uh, and we try to channel. We look for the folks that were working, mostly doing um, engineering, setting up networks, operations, support. You know the camps over in Iraq, for instance, right? So there was with all these camps that were being built around uh, the country when we were in the war. All those all those guys were coming back, and they were looking for jobs in networking and engineering. You know anything from pulling cable right through to setting up network servers, etc and then supporting those networks and then supporting the tactical communications, the strategic communications, uh, you know, of the, the soldiers in here. So and we were successful in helping, uh, you know, to meet a, uh, for this contract, to meet a initiative of having, uh, I believe it was uh, 4 or 5% uh, of folks that were veterans. So it worked out well. Okay. So we did that table back here. How about this table? Who had to go with military initiative? 
So we did. I, I'm actually, I was really impressed by the program that we have in place now. I think this, this was our third year. Um, and I, I participated in last year. But basically, we have 30 or 40 jobs isolated from military hire. And what we would do is we would go to base camps across the country and recruit anyone who's going to be out of active duty, so able for a full time position. They interview, and then we set them up for a four week training program in an isolated location in Dallas. And after the four weeks, we would then um, send them to a location for full-time employment. And that location was disclosed upon stepping forward, extending the offer. But essentially, they were four weeks at a paid training, and then get them ready to go right into the job, whether it's a sales tech or a switch tech, depending on their um, uh, understanding of network components. So it was, I think, a two-month hiring process for 40 hires from these locations across the country where we couldn't find talent. I mean, these are very obscure locations, and military, you know, they're very willing to travel and relocate, they do it their whole lives. And uh, they were very grateful for the opportunity, and they're some of our best uh, our best employees, especially from a leadership perspective, because there's a lot of these things you can't teach. It's really, really successful program. So Andrew, just clarification, all these programs that people talk about are not um, campus hires, right? Or, or recent college recruits, they're 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 or recent college recruits that have military background. All these are experienced hires? I'm just no, I heard someone say it was campus. Who's campus? The one I was talking about was experience. Didn't someone just say they did some on campus? We we have a, a campus talent summit that we do out in Minnesota. Um, okay, we only have one diversity recruiter. We're trying to expand it to our whole team. So she does a lot on her end as far as networking. We're trying to recruit actively. We haven't had a lot of success in that space yeah. just yet. Um, locally, we've been just kind of finding them. Mm -hmm. um, whether they're coming out of you know ROTC now that they were in school, um, served, came back, went to school, um, we're just kind of finding them at this point. Is how it's especially from like Rutgers and things like that. We, we get a lot of volume out of there. Okay, everybody, it's two o'clock, and we're gonna wrap up our first segment. I think we can probably go longer with this, but we're gonna take a fifteen-minute break. Um, meet me back here at 2.15 and we're going to be discussing, um, after I'm sure this may be, I don't know if we're going to have enough time, but we're going to talk about creating a strategy and tactics for finding and engaging with diverse candidates. So see you back at 2.15.
when uh, I was a manager in retail um, for a couple of years. Yeah. Still with us? Oh, is she good? Yeah. She's That's awesome. Awesome. Yeah, she's great. Yeah. She's really great. She was handpicked by like Casey and Oh, yeah? Awesome. Did you really? Yeah. I put her in my leadership background. Um, that, yeah. Um, we're we're still friends after we both left, so it's been nice. For April? Yeah. Oh yeah, it was like a cult there. It was a little frightening. <laughs> a little frightening. But she got out at a good time. Oh yeah. Yeah.
you know, I think um, you said it earlier about maybe finding what they're doing, where they go, where they hang out, those type of things. So maybe that's a, another answer to the question, but I don't know if there's any other ideas or anything, but have anything else to share. Okay. Um, this is our first year that we've been very actively recruiting for um, something we've been doing in different conferences. So we attended Grace Hopper, um, which is a big national conference. And what we did is we had a youth on site and actually extended offers on site so we could get those hires um, in the door. Again, this is our first year doing it, so we'll kind of see how that works out for us and if we're able to convert those interns into full time hires. But <coughs> that's something we've been doing. Um, and we also attended Rombo, which is another diverse conference, not specifically targeted tar tar towards STEM, but Again, just like a conference that we had in the Which was the acronym sample? Uh, reaching out from the A. The LABG and the A. Um, yeah, and then the other one is Great Hopper. Did you say mm -hmm. Great Hopper? Yeah. Um, we attend Great Hopper as well. We met the chef at work. Um, I'm missing a bunch, I know. Um, there's at least 12. <coughs> that, uh, yeah. National Black. National Black. Um, so we attend all of those as well. And then uh, one of the schools where we get the most diverse talent is the University of Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. Guys, don't go there now because I don't know. <laughs> 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 you got to plan for November, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I go in September. They have a career fair in September for both their technical and non-technical talent. Uh, and Verizon has been going there for several years. And we have a very, very strong partnership with them. And I mean, out of all, we had, I think, about 30 hires from them alone from that one school this year. And the one hire that we got that was not Hispanic was actually Asian because she wanted to be at a school where there were a lot of employers attending. And she was the one Asian student on campus. So it worked out. She stood out. And we hired her. So um, I mean, we, have, we talk about 100% diversity. There you go. 100% diversity. So. Um, don't go there because that's my school. <laughs> <laughs> I hired them. They're for me. Uh, no, but the, I would definitely recommend going there if you don't already for both your STEM and your non-STEM talent. And I haven't taught me. She went with me last oh year. And gosh, yes. it was, there's some really, really outstanding students that are going there. And you'll get tons of, tons of hires from there. A plethora of talent. Women as well, and they're not scared of the math and sciences at all. They embrace them. We had actually had high school students, middle school students approach me. They know about this conference, this um, particular fair, and they come and they want to know what can I do now to start the fair. So it was phenomenal. Phenomenal. And my client is tired about half those numbers. And, uh, the feedback a year in, year out is very, very strong, it's really committed, uh, willing, and a very high conversion rate. Most of, I say, of our campus direct conversions, probably 20% of them are GPR alone. So that's a lot. Don't get ideas, guys. <laughs> 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 okay. No, but they really are good. I mean, we have one student actually, he interned with us since his freshman year and he's coming on full time into our LDP program this summer. So when they talk about committed students, they're very committed to the companies that they, that they actually intern with. Three, three years in a row, they'll come back. Is anybody tied in like the marketing, you know, the marketing departments in the larger organizations? Maybe uh, is there a constant collaboration between HR recruiting and, and marketing? Not only the obviously like Verizon, for instance, will market their products and services, but there's is there a marketing focus with you know not only so, social media but the different clubs and the different um, schools and you know not only what's what the company does, but you know why it's attractive. You know what's going on in the employee community of the company. Is there, you know, is anybody having people go out or doing like a public relations or PR or like releasing a news release or press release with maybe that's focused on what's, what's happening amongst the employees and making more attractive to that first school. I would say Verizon. Definitely a collaboration with marketing. Uh, we do have a social media uh, that's a team that really focuses on our employer branding. So we do work very closely with our HR business partners to identify talent to feature on our website. Uh, like I had, we had a high school outreach event recently at Rutgers, and our PR team actually put an article out. So I mean, we have to about collaborating and communicating what you may be doing with them and see if there's a, a way to kind of link the two. Uh, that particular event, I had 
we had at least 15 to 20 volunteers from one of our network operations centers hosting all those, uh, that career related event to high school, to middle school students, I'm sorry, at Rutgers. Um, so it is a lot of collaboration and putting things on our social media pages. It's just a matter of how much you communicate internally with your teams so that you can leverage it. But we certainly are doing much more of it now than we have in the past. Yeah, I'm actually uh, from Bonner, so we actually acquired a lot of companies recently, so we're kind of like in a mess of an identity crisis, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, we are going to be campaigning sometime in the July, sometime this summer, um, <coughs> trying to define who we are, but at the same time, we are working with marketing. As a matter of fact, we're hiring for a, um, a talent brand specialist that's going to help lead that effort with the, um, <coughs> the, the marketing agency that we're working with as well. Um, but on top of, I think, one of the questions about what else um, besides attending conferences and going to like these clubs and stuff, we're also going to be piloting a, um, a talent scout program. So where we're actually utilizing our employees to be the ambassadors, like you know, going out and talking about the stuff that they do. So when they go out and talk, um, you know, that's the place that people want to sure. work. Now that's different. I haven't heard that. Um, certainly, I've heard companies talk about using their affinity groups and things like that, but you know, kind of the talent scout program, it's almost <laughs> like a um, ambassador program? Yeah, like basically everyone is a recruiter, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone that works at the company should be a reflection of that company. Where are you going to be going to do that? Where? Yeah, are you going to the different campuses or are you going out and Everywhere, I get social media, um, what if, you know, just uh, any networking events. Um, Steve was talking about kind of um, HR and marketing work together. Um, again, um, I just again wanted to share this because I thought it was really interesting because I know every and I've worked with employers a long time. And some of you know me and you know have been in these type of forums with me before. And um, again, when this VP of diversity, you know, just asked the question, is there anything new? They seem kind of a silver bullet. And there is no silver bullet. It's kind of everybody's still doing the same thing. And it's just a bet again, how, um, how much and how often. So I'll give you an example. And someone asked me to talk about HBCUs, but, and we will in this dialogue. But um, one of the fat five, it's not just good enough to show up for a career fair and an info session and think that you're going to have this great impact on these candidates. And the Fab Five, which I thought was interesting, I don't know if they still do it, um, as an incoming freshman, they told them that by the time you graduate, you're going to be your best friend. So imagine how that plays upon the psyche of you know you thinking you're really all that. And you're telling me that, and I haven't taken my first class, but you're telling me during my freshman orientation that by the time I finish here, I'm going to be my best friend, so I'm going to I'm going to know my work. And you just showing up trying to, I'm Google, and what? That means what? Do you know who I am? So, I mean, I'm just saying, so, um, again, um, when you start talking about strategy, um, right, no one where, where are the candidates? I'll speak for records, and this is a Fortune 25. They started sponsoring concerts, right, at Rutgers. And I mean, they're not using it as a recruiting event, but they're thinking about it from a branding event. They're cool. Right. They sponsored this. You know, another company um, did things like, um, it was around, it must have been around engineering, and there was like, um, I don't know, build a race car whatever it was that they did. And they sponsored the breakfast at that race. And they were just looking at who was emerging as the leader, you know, just kind of the observation. So, you know, sometimes when you start engaging that way, then you have to look at your um, your investment. Is it really about recruiting or is it branding? Because sometimes it's just about branding. You just, I just want you to see my name. That when you think cool, you're thinking me. When you say they care about me, you know, when I start looking at an employer, right, do they really care about me or am I just part of the number? And, you know, again, that's about branding and engagement. We've done some kind of, um, so when we think about campus, we know it's, a, it's kind of a different beast, but we also have our 
campus initiatives, and then we have um, what we call some of our hubs, where we can focus on kind of the smaller schools we're speaking up earlier. So with that, we're going to have leeway where we can really think outside of the box and kind of think about what can we do where we're not just on campus. So we had an initiative that we've done recently where it was like a tech trivia. So what we did was we kind of partnered you know, with an organization and we went on to campus. Um, and what we did, um, we made it a game. It was a tech trivia game. And it was all surrounding, you know, let me tell you a little bit more about Verizon, what we do here, and let's get some statistics about the schools. We kind of incorporated both. And we made it really, really fun um, where, you know, once kind of word of mouth got out, literally we had people giving us a call, hey, are you guys going to come back? Are you going to come here? We want this student group to be involved. So it kind of made it fun. That's one of the things we did for campus. So it kind of spread. And then for the smaller schools that we focused on, if you have the leeway, you have the budget, we also did a bowling initiative. And it sounded crazy. I remember when I went to the manager with it, they're like, what, you want to do less? Bowl? Um, it sounded crazy, but it worked. Um, we actually got hires out of this event, and what we did was we worked with the professors and the students to say, hey, listen, this is the pool that we're looking for. Can you guys have your top candidates come? We're going to sponsor, you know, this event. We're going to have um, pizza there, a bowl with the candidates, and we had two schools. We kind of bowled against, we had the schools bowl against each other, and we bowled against the winner. We had the trophy for the winner, and it was fun. We just made it a fun event, and then what we said is, as we have people kind of just standing around, you know, chat them up. We had our, you know, our supervisors there, <coughs> our different leadership, our management. Chat them up, get to know what they're about, but we want to make it a fun event. And we actually yielded higher so It was fun. And it was um, I think this came from Lisa. Um, different schools have different visa policies, right? That's when you raised mm -hmm. All right, and how to best use CPT and OPTs. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry to mention a Yeah, so I, as I was mentioning, um, a lot of STEM students have the qualified pool as international students. So we're running into this little bit of a snack with this internship. Like we found out some schools, if you hire an undergrad international student from them, you have, they can only do co-ops. They can't do internships. And you have to sign some kind of agreement with them that they work six months, off six months, go back to school, and then come back six months, and it has to be contract. So, it, and then they, um, some school won't let them use OPT if they're undergrad. So it delays the start day. Um, so I'm just, I'm just curious. Anybody had any experience, any particular school that's easier to work with than others? Because it seems like um, we have about 16 cases of international students, all of them from different schools. All the schools have different policies. We're all signing all different agreements for every single one. And so it's, it's a big problem now with the hiring manager, right? They want the student, but now they, they don't want to accept a late start day. Differentiation. And so just kind of curious if anybody else came, came across any issues. Can I just ask you, so you have international students that come as co-ops and there's like a target end date to this, this program and that's it? So we, we only offer internships and we're very specific in our job descriptions but now we're finding out that the international students who apply or got accepted, their school won't allow an internship. Oh, so their school's not letting you. Right. So you're accepting them as a co-op then? Are you making that? No, so no. We, we're at this point we're actually uh, we're drawing the offer. Okay. Because, you know, there's whole budget uh, constraints uh, restrictions, right? We budget it for 10 weeks uh, for certain headcounts, so we can't go <laughs> into right. no, I you know, the whole year. Right, so I still taking months to go right. off, and I was wondering why we should do that then, but right. I understand that. Right, so I don't know if you guys have. Or, or are, is, uh, most of you kind of just not hiring international students? That's another. So at my last company, that's what I did. I just made it a policy. Um, but you know, with the software engineering, like I was saying, it's very, very challenging. So uh, I'm, I'm actually, you know, the company was, uh, the business were willing to pay for the sponsorship. I, I was letting go of that policy. Our product team does hire international interns, mm -hmm. uh, but not co-ops. So, so they all, they stay at just internship. Mm -hmm. right. But they, I think they're the only team here that does that. Yeah, they have like more the exception to the norm. Uh, their, their particular roles are very technically specific, mm -hmm. and they tend to get more of the master's level candidate, not an undergraduate. Mm -hmm. So if they're going to get someone international, they're more likely master's or PhD. Master. But it's a very small number compared to everything else that we hire for. So is everybody else sponsored here? 
We don't. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. You do? We do. You do, yeah. okay. And do you have a quota? Do you have a percentage? Uh, we don't have a percentage, okay. but we do. Uh, but again, we do for niche skill set. Yeah. Um, so it's not for everything and anything. Right. We have, we have, you know, it's not a lot of people in this niche, but we found that OPT is a great way to try it for you. Oh, I should speak. Yeah. Because you have 18, I believe it's 18 months still. So for stamps, they get uh, 27, 27 months. months. Yeah, 27 yeah. Months. But the thing is, there's a lot of ODC companies, offshore companies, who come and now hire all these people, so now the pool has gone down considerably. Even, even so it's not only the STEM program, the students are less than every year, I don't see a lot of international students coming in really? to do the program, but also the offshore companies mm -hmm. who used to bring people from outside on L1s and other things, mm -hmm. now they can't bring them as much. Mm -hmm. So they are going that's after right. the OPT candidates, so because yeah. that's attractive for them. Because yeah. they don't have to cater to, but with the new immigration bill changes, that probably could change, yeah. hopefully. It yeah. becomes easier for employers to hire a lot of uh, yeah. candidates who really don't need sponsorship anymore right. if that bill passes. But right, right. It might be easier if you approach it from the side of the schools that you partner with and find out which ones have the, um, are going to let you do the internship versus the co-op, mm -hmm. and which of their career services will work with you through doing the CPT paperwork. Yeah. And then just just stay with just those stay schools, with those schools yeah. for that yeah, that population because that okay. that's that's what we do and that okay. it works with us. Okay. Just fix some of the schools. Yeah. 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 And we have we actually have a person at our company who works in um, well it's, it's our like a shared services center but she handles all of our international relocations and she does that. <laughs> okay. So when we have an international student like that we contact her and she'll facilitate that. But I can. I can we can talk about it. Okay. Thanks. Answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Good. I just want to um, just share this. If anyone is looking for like kind of that um, um, experienced hire, um, I ran across a, com a company and just was in conversation with them maybe a couple weeks ago, and they want to do something where they want to offer, I'm going to call it a midternship. And they have a pool of international candidates that are already, I guess they're authorized to work here. They have the experience and the degree. But for some reason, they can't get the position here. I don't understand it, have no clue. But they have this pool of STEM candidates. So if anybody needs that, I would be happy to share that. And you can contact them directly. But I thought it was very interesting. Um, the next question, Paul, this came from you, Paul, right there. You asked, best strategies for targeting, did you ask that, you kind of talked about it? I think we already talked about it, yeah. Okay, we're good. And um, you said, you might have talked about this too, your company has begun looking into sponsoring STEM competitions? Yeah, I think that was the high school. At the high school level? Yeah. Okay. Um, the one thing, um, I just want to share a, a competition I went to. Um, it was for engineering, and they did school competition, and it was seven, seven schools across the U.S., and I think like a couple in Canada, and they had um, like this project. So they competed on the school level, and then the winner of the school came together, and they competed, I guess, in that region. Then. From there, that team came together and they competed nationally. And they presented it in front of like, you know, the president, the CEO, and uh, uh, all these hiring managers, and um, diversity, the global diversity manager was there. And these kids, like, was the most amazing um, presentation that I had ever seen, like way over my head, but just the thought that they put into it, um, their presentation style, <coughs> all of this was observed by the hiring manager. And from there, they were able to compete on a global level. And at the end of the day, it was an internship at any location of their choice. And so I just thought it was um, something that was fun. It was something that was engaging, just the whole experience. Look, I'm still talking about it years later. I know these kids were um, talking about it years later. And it was like in Jersey, 
um, I remember afterwards, like we went to Lion King, we went to um, some place that we did like Italian, made our own Italian meal, and I know the females were like, can I, can you take it to Canal Street? I'm like, we didn't have enough time to go to Canal Street. Um, <laughs> but um, it was an experience that really, A, um, gave exposure to these smart kids, it was something that was um, something they had to get thought through because it wasn't just, okay, we're going to do this next weekend. You know, it's over with. It was something that they had to really take time. And then at the end of the day, um, they got the internship experience, but then the hiring managers wanted them full time. And so I remember they had this table, and these kids, they had already had to offers. So even by the time they got to the this competition, right, where I'm going to get in front of you, know, you know, serious senior leaders, they had already had the office. So that just told me again, that best and the brightest, like, you gotta come, I don't just don't know what you do to get that best and the brightest. Um, someone asked the question, what is the best way to maintain your network of, and I guess keep your candidates engaged off season? Who asked that question? Okay, so thank you, Steve. I, I think, um, you know, I think you have to have, you know, you have a marketing sales and marketing program, right, for the company, for revenue perspectives, right, uh, revenue, but, you know, what we're doing is part of the newsletter that goes out, it doesn't only go out to um, decision makers, for instance, it does go out to people who are in our database that have specific skill sets that are core functions within an organization. So at least they know what's going on with the company, um, you know, what we're doing uh, from, a, you know, from a technical perspective of what our mission is and things of that nature. So at least they still know who we are um, from more of what the company does rather than what the hiring opportunity is. So it's more soft, soft selling and soft engagement with them about what we do. Sometimes I'm really interested in that from Martin. Um, we're an insurance broker, and one of the things that we actually hosted an event um, last week from one of our schools in Howard, and um, off, off recruiting season, they host a program called the Summer Howard Intern School, and it's basically a week-long conference where they choose 50 of the best students in the insurance school, and they, um, towards the end of the week, they have a case study competition but the, the week is filled with office visits or interactions with different insurance companies. So Marsha actually hosted a day in our Hartford office and we were able to have interactions with candidates at different levels of their um, collegiate career. So we had um, experience with freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors. So that's one way of really interacting with candidates off season because our name was out there. You know, we were able to show them what our office is like, you know, off season. So that's probably one way of just maybe Hosting office visits um, off season as well. Anyone else want to share around the engagement off season? Okay. Um, <coughs> what are, let's see, <coughs> we kind of talked about this in the last segment, but it's come up again. Um, are participants channeling candidate passion as part of the recruiting process? And they want to know if can share um, program success. And we kind of talked about it, but it's still here again. So again, channeling the passion, I think, um, I think um, Christian to me have talked about it, or maybe that was your question. Um, how to, again, being a small company versus a larger company, um, how do you um, make your company attractive, I guess, in the scheme of things or in the competition? Um, Again, um, tapping into the passion of the student. Well, uh, being that um, it's the the jury's kind of out on that right now because uh, this summer is actually going to be my first summer. Um, I actually had a few interns begin today, and the remaining um, will begin in the next week or two. So the jury's kind of out on how that how that's going to pan out. But over the last uh, two three months in, in recruiting and networking and, and attracting. Candidates. It's very, I mean, it's very simple. Um, I, I more or less just personally just called each one, engaged in a conversation, checked in to see you know, how you know, how the semester was going. Um, just make it more friendly, more conversational, and just make it seem that they are important. And I did not forget about them. I just feel like another NFI is still, you know, just keep from running, um, you know, during their you know, course work and in case other 
job offers may come, you know, in front of them, you know, when they already accepted a, you know, my, my offer. So just phone, phone calls often. Just keep that uh, just keep that fire fresh. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with that anymore. Um, being a large company, you know, we're lucky to have resources that periodically touch the student, give them updates, like you're mentioning, and some small touch points here and there throughout the year. But um, even just a quick email once every two months. I mean, it doesn't be that, that repetitive, but just to show that you're thinking about them and you care, there's a big lull. Sometimes we're going out with offers in October, a lot of them start in June, and they're still going to career fairs, and they should. I, I like, encourage them to see what else is out there. It's the best uh, experience for the student. However, I want them to remember me and my business and my opportunity that I presented to them. And most of the time, from my experience, at least from when I've interviewed and I selected a company to join, it's because of those quick relationships that I had with the, the human resource partner or the recruiter that I was working with. You know, I will obviously have the best interest in the opportunity, the brand, that's why you're halfway there, but it's really that relationship together that fully pulls you in. So I would encourage you all the time, just how are you, how's your semester, just ask them how the tests are going. When I tell you, oh, it's midterm, it's crazy right now, how are you doing, and, and stuff like that. It's, it really helps them to, to commit. And I, I, I have had, I think I've reduced in half the amount of drop offs we had since our season last year just because of staying in them this year. So it really makes life easier in, in April and May when you're trying to close out the season and there's less of those empty, uh, the empty seats that do fall off because you're going to get full off no matter what. <coughs> and even too, uh, like, uh, I like to connect, them, connect with each, each um, intern on uh, social media, connect them, you know, personally on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, not just NFI career site. You know, uh, reaching out to them and connecting, but it's Chris Dale, the college career manager, reaching out, you know, um, sharing articles that, you know, that relate to supply chain or whatever major that they're in, um, whatever they're about to get into with NFI, share information that's going on in the industry, um, just to let them know, like, hey, you know, you're going to be getting involved in some, some exciting um, projects and whatnot. Just want to keep you abreast on, you know, what, what's going on. I think that's a good segue into the next question. Um, how does your organization utilize the tools um, tools of social media to create a talent pipeline? So how do you guys use social media? So you talked about um, social media in terms of engagement. So my, my approach is um, I mean, we, we have uh, a marketing team that kind of handles the, the, the macro um, approach to social media. Um, then I like comments. Pivot and kind of stem off that, and kind of give my, my personal touch to social media, just with sharing articles, um, you know, building you know, my, my connections um, up a little bit with you know, students, whether I'm recruiting a particular student, just any any potential applicant that's in a particular major that I'm, I'm looking at, I'll just go ahead and reach out first and just try to you know, connect with them via social media. Anyone else want to share how they use social media as a part of their recruiting process? Uh, I'm just going to offer, this is just, um, I always look at ROI, right? Any, any, any effort you put in, you have a limited amount of resources, and a lot of big companies, even if you are uh, big, you have more headcount, the reality is you actually have more campus hired to hire, you know, so the ratio as a candidate to recruiter it is proportionally larger. So I'm always looking at what is the quickest, what is the best method for you guys to get the biggest return. So um, I personally don't give myself too much pressure about social media anymore because reality, the companies that do very well and actually get a lot of traction, they have dedicated headcount who tweet all day, they uh, subscribe to these, uh, you know, SaaS programs that mm -hmm do blasting and then they have content messages that kind of goes out, you know, with a timetable calendar all set up, right? Mm -hmm. And and so, um, you know, which way I tried to do that in my last company. Um, and and we, we did do this pilot program. And, you know, if you look at how much effort, number of hours putting in, but the number of candidates you get back, I, I don't quite see it. Maybe the investment is not long enough. So I just kind of, uh, yeah. It depends on again. It depends on your recruiting effort and and um, and what do you what do you need to do. I don't necessarily give myself hold myself to a certain standard when it comes to social media. But from from a candidate perspective, mm -hmm. you don't engage with them on social media, at least with this generation. 
it's very difficult um, irrespective of the field that you're going to go in especially if you're engaged with them in technology Twitter, LinkedIn you've got to engage with them on those social medias sharing articles, sharing things I, I that mean, becomes so I don't know if it actually net out more return I'm just, and I'm and be, only because at the end of the day they still come through traditional methods like they go to the career fair they go to, you, you know what I mean? so it's kind of hard to say it, the cause and effect is because they saw this article or they saw this tweet. I, it, 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 it's hard to link that, right? And so if we if we do a quick survey and figure out how you know how the student come to us ultimately and you get to hire, uh, I just you know again it could be more scientific study, but I just find very hard to make that link between social media and then get somebody hired. For us, at least in the light industrial mm -hmm. arenas, we get a lot of the hires from the Facebooks. Mm -hmm. We do, okay. We get IT and other things from LinkedIn. Yeah. Oh, I mean LinkedIn is, yeah. 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 So I think the social media needs to, need to build a presence so that the millennials who are looking for the job can find you and feel comfortable going to a company that is established on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. Um, and so that they can find you and feel comfortable going to a company that is established on Facebook, LinkedIn, they're so into technology, they have their cell phones with them all the time. So when they're at these places and they, and they can see you have this presence, they're more inclined to go towards that company that you know, does focus on those type of recruiting tactics. And you, if there may not be a huge return, return on investment, like you say. So it may not be the best recruiting tactic, but building that presence and you know, connecting to the students is key. And connecting with the schools you go to and the different companies, that's <coughs> when this, that's what the students look for. So, so even if you could, yeah. I mean, it may not, you know, we may not get mm -hmm. the best candidates from it, but taking that time to build those relationships and those connections, it does help you know, build a relationship to then, when you go on campus, they say, oh yeah, I saw that, you know, we're connected via this. And so can I, can I just ask people who do, do, let's say Facebook, what, what specific content, what do you, what do you do to drive the presence? We have, well, I mean, Facebook. You know, we have ads. Mm -hmm. You directly do ads. You can target specific well, demographics. Facebook or like, like, like both. Like oh, so okay. And demographics. And then, I mean, they, they actually work. You can track it. So the ads you're talking about, you buy ads or you just kind of have... We create ads. Yeah, okay. we create ads and then we can see how many people clicked on it, how many people viewed it, how many people directly applied from our ad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right now, there are a lot of tools which can give you ROI on where they came from. Because mm -hmm. if you look at every big company, they have the right. Facebook, Twitter, mm -hmm. links there, and their big data analytics, which gives yeah. you yeah. where they came from, which which link they linked to, and then how they came back. So okay. Without okay. spending a lot of money. Okay, great. I also think it's a willingness to adapt, even if you can't put a marketable return on investment on that effort. If, if you're not out there in a social brand aspect, it's almost like you're outdating yourself. Even for me, like I'm like all I do is if I go to a campus event, I'll put an update saying I'll be at this campus, see you there. And students, because I connect, I try to connect every student I meet when I'm on campus. And even if there's a LinkedIn connection, they see that they might come up to me and talk to me. They know that like you're out there, and that's a, a, a big way to differentiate your brand. I don't think you want to be known as a company that's unwilling to to use these free platforms. I mean, ads are another thing. But at least just put your name out there in, in a way that you're you're saying hello. It just differentiates yourself in a very competitive market, and companies that aren't willing to adapt, you know, they kind of almost start to carry that stigma with them years down the road, and you've seen it with more roles and whatnot. So, yeah, I think it's important to at least touch the tool here and there. I think also with the, you know, new generation, the you know, they're not only you're, while you're out there researching to find out where they are and you know what their passions and interests, they're checking all the all the companies out that they're interested in. You know, they're going out to the glass stores, they're going out to the employee sites. You know, so I, I think that's important to have a, a realization and rec recognition of that uh, to ensure that, you know, you have people that are in your company talking well about your company because that's that's marketing and it's not your choice, right? It's the, it's the employee's choice to market what they want and you have no control of that. So how, so how do you ensure that, you know, Different people in different departments you know, are, are uh, having a good <coughs> experience, and that's a that's a whole other dynamic, and that's a whole other uh, situation that companies are dealing with as well. And 
think it's also about how you deliver your brand. I think from that perspective, it's also very important because a prospective candidate, if he, if he or she doesn't know anything about your company, that's your way of showing and differentiating yourself as what you do. So, you know, we'll highlight our employee stories that we have on our career site, have them see the things that they're not aware of, uh, like the things that we're doing in our innovation center, things that people don't aren't aware of because they can only think of our consumer brand. So we leverage that to make sure they're aware from, a, from what it's like to work here. That's a great avenue for us to get there. So you, they ask us questions, well, what's that work in engineering? Here to check out our story on one of our engineers who just got an award for X, Y, and Z. I mean, so that's the, our platform for us to let them educate themselves on what our company is and what we're all about. So even if it's not always like, hey, we're hiring for X, Y, Z position, it's still an avenue for them to see what our company is like to work for. Something that's really helpful for us at United Health Group, we're a Fortune 14 company, but our recruiting team doesn't leverage social media like we really should be. Um, we use a recruiter chat function where we have a recruiter dedicated to two hours once a week or they're just on IM and anyone on our career site, uh, we have a separate college page just for um, internships and full-time opportunities. Um, you can chat one-on-one -on -one with the recruiters and say, hey, I applied to this position. What, what is that really? Um, and then our regular career page has a separate chat function, but that's something that we're leveraging more. Um, we're actually getting it um, phone friendly because you can't use it on your phone and everyone's on their iPhone in the middle of class. So um, we're trying to make sure we're a little bit more visible. Um, nobody knows what United Health Group is on campus. I mean, they're all on their parents' insurance, so they have no idea who we are. Um, so we're we're coming at it from a marketing perspective, and um, we have a team in the Philippines that sources on LinkedIn for us um, and just funnels up um, all the candidates to our um, college page and recruiter chat so we can engage them and make it more personal. Um, our program, though, we just hired 500 people for one program. 75% um, I would say is all from on campus. So that's how they heard about us, not from social media. So it's kind of hit or miss from what I've seen. And again, that's just a whole lot around branding. And I think that, um, again, um, you know, which was my, kind of my initial, initial comment, you can't expect to show up just to go to a career fair, you know, your info session, and, you know, they're going to say, yes, I want to work for you. So again, it's like, um, again, how often are you getting your message and naming your company um, out in front of these candidates? At some point, you want your... Um, your message, who you are, your logo, whatever the case may be, in front of them multiple times, right? And um, again, when you can even when it goes back to one of the original questions around poor schools, um, a poor school tactic or a tier one might be we're um, going to the career fair, we're doing on campus interviews, we're doing um, um, networking night, I might be recruiter in residence, I might be, um, you know, working with the student organization. So you might be touching that campus, you know, five or six times per semester, right, or a tier one or more, right? And a tier two might be we're going to do kind of the basics and tier three might be like something else, everything um, kind of remotely. But again, if everybody's doing the same thing, what's the differentiator? You know, I remember somebody said, I'm a widget, is a widget, is a widget. What makes my widget any better than your widget? So from an employer perspective, taking that same concept, what makes you an employer of choice and makes you different than anybody else? It's all about that differentiating factor. Um, I don't know, we're at like 2.58, so we have about two minutes. Okay, can I ask a question? Courtney, you mentioned you have a live, live chat like, mm -hmm. on your career space, or yeah. and you know when they're poking around, a, a prompt will just go up be like, hey. Yeah, they'll just wait. pop up on your window, and they'll say, hey, I'm having trouble applying to a rec number or whatever. Um, and as a recruiter, I can go into the rec and find out you know, exactly where they are. We also have um, our Twitter handle on the side of our college page where um, our Twitter account will be trending in there, so like all of our recent posts or articles that we've retweeted or something like that um, kind of stream simultaneously. So it's completely open forum and our recruiting team is only seven recruiters. How do, how do we filter, how, who filters out? Do you have a team dedicated to just focusing like that content? To getting people to recruiter chat, you mean? Or just no, for the first live feed. Uh, we have our marketing team as well. It's um, not through through us. No, okay. We just we tell them what content we want in there based off of what okay. we're learning, and they do it for us. 
And then how about that live chat? Is that just for assistance, or is it something like you get prompted when people are visiting and you can just jump in and say, hey, do you have any questions? Let's it's know. a two-hour cool. window on Tuesdays, um, and they can ask you anything. It could be program-specific, hey, I heard about your technology development program on campus. What is it? I'm a public uh, a health major. Design like a virtual life. career for Yeah, yeah, but it, it's more personal than right. that. Yeah. And, and do you, do you promote that so they know when those windows are they're promoting it. It was only on our, our college website, but what we're trying to do now is tell people about that on campus because I get a lot of pharmacy majors that come up to us on campus and I don't recruit anything pharmacy related. So right. I tell them, you know, go to the recruiter chat function. You'll be able to connect with someone who's better, you know, route you where you need to be. So we're getting a lot more traffic and we're trying to differentiate our college page from our corporate page. Um, because it's not as attractive um, to college students. They want something that's much more in the now and to make ourselves more available to them. Um, more interesting, which is nice. So, I'm going to have to stop you, Lisa, but we will pick up with you when we come back. We will have a lot. And um, this wraps up our second segment. Um, we're going to take a 15 minute break. We'll be back at 3.15. And we are going to be talking about how to, um, uh, what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about strategies and tactics. No, this is what it's about hiring and retaining. So, hiring and retaining. So, we're going to talk about some best practices and some retaining strategies. So, see you back at 315.
<laughs> and you never report them. Um, usually whoever's moderating the virtual career fair, they actually do a very good job of checking in with you, just like at a regular career fair when they come and talk to you at the tables. So um, I found it to be kind of fun, actually. Um, you spend a lot of time talking to students, and I'll have a line of X amount of students waiting to talk to me. So I can easily have 25, 30 people in the queue where they're like, oh, Cassandra, I'll be right back. I, you know, I'm going to run over this table because there's no line, and then I'll be back. So I found it to be really interesting, a lot of fun. I've done it with Georgia Tech. Um, that's the one that sticks out in my mind because those were MBAs. Okay. So it's a higher level conversation, obviously, than when I'm dealing with just the general population of undergrads. Okay. And in terms of um, receiving their emails, is there like a portal, or do they just email their resume directly to you? So the beauty is when you're working on a virtual career fair, the platform is completely tricked out, and for lack of a better word, with all the bells and whistles for them to a, capture all the information, capture all the dialogue that you have with every single candidate. Everything is downloadable on a, dash, on a separate dashboard, and you have access to that link for X amount of time. And then you can email it to yourself and you know, export it, so on and so forth. So you have access to all this information. If I want to go back and look at a candidate and say, oh, what was that conversation about to remind myself, I can do that. The resumes are also held on that same site as well. Okay. Thank you. That was helpful. No problem. Yeah, we did it as well. It was, good. it was a good precursor to having an input session. Oh, okay. You know, so, so if there was interest from the candidates in the career fair, virtual career fair, mm -hmm. everybody would be on campus in two weeks, you know, come on by, stop by, and then we just post. Okay. So it worked out. It was pretty good. Who sent up these virtual career fairs? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, go for it. Is it the company or the school? And you get invited to be part of the virtual career fair? So yeah, um, we've been invited to attend career fairs so like uh, Georgia Tech sent something and said, hey, we're having a virtual career fair. I've done career fairs that has been a consortium of schools where we want to target maybe three or four out of that, you know, 15 that are participating. Um, but typically we get pinged um, in order to participate. If I see something, I'll put it out there, but typically we get hit. Frequently also, if, you, if you're looking to post jobs at specific schools that you're targeting, mm -hmm. when you register with the, you know, you register your company's presence and what you do, uh, you put some job, you know, you put job postings out there. They'll let you know if they do have virtual career fairs. You know, you can you can find that information out directly from the career center or even at the site. Are you interested in a virtual career fair? And they'll send you. Okay. Thank you. Um, and you, if you're not paying or invited by uh, a school who has like, that platform uh, for the career fair, are, are there other platforms that you can subscribe to or that you have to um, you know, purchase in order to kind of uh, invite yourself or to sell to a, a school that you want to be at? You have a great question. You can do anything with money. It can happen for you, right? So, uh, I'm very clear. Some of them are free, but many of them we do pay for. So um, depending upon who it is that's hosting and what school it is, uh, so that's so the first answer I'm going to give you. If you don't have access to that, you're not getting information. And to piggyback on what Steve said, essentially once you start posting at schools, they'll let you know, hey, we also participate in this career fair. Um, and a lot of schools participate in consortium career fairs where they, you know, X amount of schools part of it. So you're even getting exposure to schools that you wouldn't normally travel to. I mean, the benefit ultimately is when, when you're trying to sell it back to the business for why they should, you know, pay for this. Because I'm sure you're going back to the business and hey, can I, can I have some money to buy this career fair? Um, the, the, the sell for that is, hey, you're not losing me in the office. I'm still here, and there's no there's no T and E associated. Right. So there's the, 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 that, that's a quick sell in terms of how we do it and why we do it. And ultimately, the rest of the conversation is about we're moving. This is a technological environment and world is rapidly changing. These are some of the things that we have to do in order to even, you know get entrance into the game. So long one to answer. <laughs> some of the career fairs you would feel like you are right in the thing. They show the people coming in, and they tell you which table you are and they show all the graphics and uh, the light person coming out, the 3D version of the person coming out. So. They have a lobby. <laughs> they have lobby. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All that. yeah virtual <laughs> lobby, check-in and all those things. So if, 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 no, if, if pe for those who haven't seen it, um, go to youtube.com slash college recruiter and there's, there's a demo there. And, and you can see exactly what it looks like from a candidate side <coughs> and from an employer side. So, like, the, the your fingers going a million miles an hour, I, I can imagine. If you've got, like, <laughs> ten people talking at, yeah. at, at you at once, 
but you can you can have multiple conversations at once. You can have a conversation with multiple people. Um, so if it's the same kind of stuff, like we're coming to your school next, we can hear some basic information, watch our videos, so we can spend our time more efficiently. So you guys are then, requesting you add that into the information that you're going to send? I absolutely will. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really worried. Yes, I will include information because I was going to ask the question. Does anyone do, do this the right word, um, sponsor their own virtual career fair? Which, you want to go You know, like it's, you know, an NFI in this time is virtual career fair. Our military team has done their own virtual Verizon, mm -hmm. including Verizon virtual career fair for the like, military and the shadows. Um, but we haven't done it on this collegiate side yet, but we might explore tapping into it in the future. We also noticed that the, a lot of, most of the colleges and universities outsource their career fair job uh, advertising pages to a couple of companies. I think one was like simplicity, and then mm -hmm. a couple of smaller, you know, and, and then I just got an email the other day that there's a consolidation. So there's a small uh, number of providers, and you may want to re reach out to those providers to see which schools do career fairs and maybe create a database and then pick and choose out of those schools. Uh, again, to, to the point of the uh, t &E, right? Uh, you know, if you have a, more of that data, then you can say, hey, if we can do career fairs at these schools because, you know, based on, you know, what we want to find out, right, this, uh, you know, computer programming uh, in this marketplace. And, and you know, there's 10 schools for this organization that do career fairs virtually. You know, instead of traveling to 10 schools. One company that regularly sends out information is Career Eco. I don't know if anyone in the room has used them. <coughs> yeah, I mean, Career Eco is huge. They post them all year round, all kinds of places. I've actually used um, Career I was thinking about the name and when you said it, I was the one. We, um, as far as ROI, um, you, I think it, it worked for us better. This is my previous company, by the way. Um, in May, when we stopped going to the schools, and then again around the August time frame before we went out to the schools, and we found um, a lot of offer acceptances at those times. Hmm. I am going to refrain from for some comments, and I'll just share it in my follow-up. How about that? Okay. <laughs> that. So um, I will just share it in my follow-up to you. Um, we're going to move on to um, kind of the next topic. Okay. Um, somebody asked more information on how companies are partnering with HBCUs and what has been your level of engagement and what's the payoff. Who's the payoff? Okay, it's a good question. <laughs> I agree. I didn't know what it was. So just just want to throw out and anybody can answer. Um, how are partnering with some of the HBCUs? Mm -hmm. I've been uh, going off what I said earlier. With, uh, um, one of our schools is Howard, and um, the summer intern school. Um, we've actually been a part. Of, it's actually been in existence for 37 years, and um, Marsh has been a participant for the last five years. So it's a great way for us to um, have exposure to those candidates and we've received about, for throughout the five years that we've been doing it, probably about maybe 10 to 15 hires so far. Good. And yeah, and um, after, usually what happens after the summer intern school, we extend offers and then, because they participate in a case study presentation as well, something similar to what you mentioned, Andrea. Mm -hmm. and, um, the hiring managers have exposure to them and they were able to extend offers right away. And because they seen they do have interactions with them, they're more likely to accept those offers with us. So in part with that, I'm not sure if the other HBCUs have that, but maybe having um having interactions with the professor, that's a great way, you know, to, to kind of see if there's other programs like that. And it really gives um that demographic demographic of students an opportunity to really see for us what the insurance industry is all about, you know, just to really have a more diverse state of candidates. So that's that's how we've interacted with Howard. And Howard is actually one of our sister company's clients. So we have that going for us as well. <laughs> 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 
Uh, I would, um, we have, uh, have a colleague on my team that actually helped create our HBCU strategy. It's still pretty new for us. I think uh, you know, we have worked with HBCUs in the past, actually had ownership over Howard and the AUT school a couple years back. Um, and what I've learned is with HBCUs, you really need to know the university. Um, where I've learned that I cannot go to Howard and expect to get 15, 20 engineers or computer science students because that's just not what that school is for. Um, if I want to go there for some of our more detailed customer services, we might be better off. Um, but I've also learned that they push for students to go to grad school and pursue a master's in education. Yeah. So at the same time, it's really about knowing what that school is like and really know, having that background. Uh, and then the other thing that I also learned is in regards to strategy, you can't just go there once, like you mentioned, and expect results. Uh, you really need to build true relationships with HBCUs. Um, whether it's your alumni and having the dedicated alumni that are going to consistently go back throughout the year is really what's going to help execute a really strong uh, strategy at an HBCU. Uh, and that's just based on my experience a couple years back. I no longer have that responsibility, but as of right now, my colleague is working on the HBCU strategy. She has really targeted her HBCU schools to be the ones that are more focused on STEM talent, where they have a large number of engineer, engineers and career science students that we can tap into. And part of our strategy involves, you know, continuous engagement from our colleagues in those areas so that it's easier for each perspective to go a couple times throughout the year versus just once or twice for career fairs. I think you said something very, very key, you know the campus. And um, I know, um, and I, you hear me keep saying the bad five, how it's one of them, Spellman's another one. Mm -hmm. But Spellman's culture is not take the grad, take a um, take a job after you complete your undergraduate. They're saying stay. So I'm like, so why is someone on your list? Yep. And you trying to hire full time oh, undergraduate? It goes That's back not. It goes back to the earlier conversation though. You you gotta get your hooks in them at some point. Right. You gotta kind of put that brand out there. So I'm coming from not to say, not to interpret engagement, so it's important to engage, but again, to your point, understanding the culture of the campus. So if you know that they're not promoting taking a full-time job upon the completion of your four-year degree and staying for your graduate degree, then how do you, so then what's that strategy around engagement, right? And how do you keep them engaged in their, um, their university process? So I just want to give some quick facts about HBCUs. Um, I think that might have been the only one that was around HBCUs. So well, here are the fun facts. Um, a few years ago, I served on the White House Initiative for HBCUs. And so there are only 105 HBCUs. Um, what constitutes an HBCU is that they were established prior to 1964. And that was under the um, Higher Education Act of 1965. And since we are talking about um, the STEM disciplines, I'm going to specifically talk about engineering. There are nine HBCUs that produce the largest numbers of African American engineers. And those nine are Morgan, North Carolina a and Tuskegee, Howard, Tennessee State, Florida A&M, Hampton, Southern, and Prairie View A&M. And that's my, my two trivia facts about HBCUs. Yeah, I think, you know, the only other thing I would add is knowing that you're, you're still going to get good candidates or whatnot from the other HBCUs, but just don't go in expecting more than five in that. Uh, one of our best um, hires from Howard is actually a graduate from our business development program, and he's like one of the most outstanding students that we've hired, and we're like, wow, he's from Howard, we want more of him. Okay, well, he's only come a few of the dozen. You normally get those all the time, so, you know. You're going to get quality, but it's, just, it's not quantity at those HBCUs. So as long as you go in knowing that, I think uh, your strategy can rather be really well developed to get your recruitment team. Um, so I'm going to pick one you right now. We, uh, we were, Joanne and I were talking about um, <coughs> one of her recruitment um, kind of, and especially as we talk about engagement and retaining, and hers was around um, a student accepting an offer and basically keeping them engaged from offer through their actual start. And one of my questions was going to ask, um, so before I come to you, how many 
Any anybody doing exploding offers? Was it exploding offer? That's what I said. First time I heard that term, I'm like, what is that? And actually, I heard it from Goldman Sachs. And it's where you're giving an offer and you have X amount of time to accept. So if you accept, like say in week one, you might get a $5,000 bonus. You might wait till week two. Now it's reduced to 2500 So like, it's just going away. So anybody do that? We do it. Oh, you? Air products? We've done it for about five years. We, um, so the last, I'd say, around each year, we hire about between 55 and 65 engineers. They're almost all from our intern program. And we give them offers around Labor Day, like when they go back to school. And because we need to know how many are going to say yes or no in order to how many others we would have to hire on campus, um, we give them a deadline of October 15th, so it's six weeks. If they answer by that date, they get their full sign-on bonus. And if they answer after that date, they get it dwindles until November 1st, and then they can. That's what the last date they can. But what about schools that have restrictions? Yeah. Like they, they say you cannot force our students. They either answer us or they don't. Okay. They either answer us or they don't get the job. Okay. Yeah. All right. yeah. And I think, and I, and I asked that question because even as it relates to interns, um, how? Because you, you kind of answered my question, Tracy, in that. You're trying to extend the offer right after their um, internship experience because you want them off yeah. the market, really, right. Right. to not really, yeah. even though it's nice and we want you to mm -hmm. take your time. We want you out of that competition, right? right. We want to snag you. So, yeah. um, but very few of them answer us prior to that October 15th oh. first deadline. Very few. Like maybe that that week we'll start getting a few, like on Monday. But mm -hmm. whatever that deadline is, usually it's a, if we do it on a Friday. That's when they all start trickling in. And usually we get about 75% by that date. Wow. And then wow. by that first cutoff date, yeah. By the first cutoff date. Yep, which is six weeks usually. And then, <laughs> and then no, it's usually uh, around October 15th, okay. somewhere around there. Okay. So it's about six weeks from when we gave them the offer. And then the people who are, you know are coming in after that are the are you know the ones we're considering at risk, right? Yeah. So yeah. we we certainly we're engaging with them and checking in with them. But at the end of the day, I mean, we we only do it because we need to know how many how how many other people we need to be recruiting. But we're we're we give them the offer and we yeah we want to take them off the market but we're very upfront and honest with them and saying you know we know you're going to go back on campus and you're going to go to your purpose and you're going to recruit and we instruct them i mean the more you know about our timing about our process and the more you know about the timing and process of anybody else you're recruiting with will better position them to make their decision according to the timeline that works for them so don't go on campus and think you can interview with you know exxon or one of our competitors on October 29th, and you're going to get an answer in time to give us an answer because you're not. So yeah. if you know our process. Get in their line quicker so that you can get an answer so that you get the best job for you. And and if it's not us, that's fine because we want to get someone who our job is the best job for them. So I. I, I like the idea, and I, I think it depends on the company and the, and the industry. So um, I've done this little test, right? Um, if I, if I, I usually give them two weeks to make a decision, and I, I really, really care about what the school requirement, but I have to tell you, in, in financial services, some of the schools in New York, they will come back. The students will get the cursor services call back mm -hmm. and say, we have till January, whatever. And and if we don't, if they, we don't want to go back to the same school, we we, we have to abide by that day. Um, but, but here's my little scientific study. So um, <laughs> if the student really wants a job, they will call back within 10 business days, OK? If they call back at the tail end of that two weeks, they will always, um, and I've seen this, um, defunct from the program before the program's over, whatever the development program is. It's a two year or three year. Um, the retention rate with those students are significantly lower. Now, my population pool is not huge, right? It's like <laughs> in the 50s, in the, in the last, you know, uh, three, four years I've been doing this in different industry, but I would always, I could tell you right now, it's 100%. If they come back at the very tail end, the second week with their answers, they will not stay with the company long enough to finish the program. 
So, and I just want to add our, so we only do the exploding offers that's you're calling them to, to our interns. Mm -hmm. For our new, um, for people we would meet on campus or from other, no. you know, areas, we don't do that. We give them two weeks. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, but, but, okay, so just to clarify, the exploding offer is for those, of those that have, interns that have completed and they're the rising seniors yep. and mm -hmm. right, getting yep. ready to graduate that yep. June or, okay. Yep. Got it. So, um, so we, we don't do exploding offers at that capacity as their product does. We do extend our, our, our interns to our offers to our interns before they leave at the end of the summer. We do give them an earlier deadline date, but we do tell them if they go later, they risk losing their, prefer, their preferred location mm -hmm. um, and ideal pro uh, uh, projects that they might be moving into, whether they're coming in as a second intern, a uh, return intern, excuse me, or, or full time because at that point, you know, we can't just wait for you forever. Mm -hmm. You've already interned with us, you already know whether or not you want to stay with the company. If the company's the right fit for you, it's just a matter of them from there identifying where the location and best um, departmental functional team would be for you. Um, so that's really the, the, that's really all that they really lose in not getting it to us earlier in the in the season when we give them their deadline date. But if they do ask for extension, we give it to them. So um, I'm going to um, ask Joanne to just kind of share for us. It was um, when we were earlier talking about the fine and um, diverse candidates, and I don't know if it was um, Lisa or someone else talking about it, but basically African American and Hispanic. And um, so, and we were talking, and then I know one of the questions was how you kind of keep them engaged through the process. So, Joanne, I'm going to ask you to pick it up from there with your example. Um, I work for More Trench and we are a geotechnical subcontractor. Um, easiest way to explain it, they're engineers that like to play in the dirt. <laughs> <laughs> um, we had a summer intern who just blew us away. She was wonderful as an engineer, just the female Hispanic who made her walk before she even left the building. She went back to the Colorado School of Mines, mm -hmm. and we stayed in touch with her, you know, holidays, hey, what's like I do, hope everything's doing well, you know, as far as finals, and um, sent her a warm sweatshirt, and just little different things. And she would reach back out, you know, have a couple of questions about housing, moving to the East Coast, things like that. Um, set her up with a real estate agent, just anything that we could do to, to make it easier for her. <laughs> about the end of March, beginning of April, she calls us up, very upset. Another company that she met at an event, offered her a job, sight on feet. She's never interviewed with them. Um, offered her about $10,000 more than we even offered her, and she accepted. So I get on the phone with her, and I'm a big one for her. It's not about the money. If it's about the money, you're going to always be chasing the money. So I said, take the money out of the equation. What's their culture like? They promised, they're out of Kansas City. Um, they promised her whatever location she wanted to go to. She wants to go to New York, so put her in New York. San Francisco, she'll go to San Francisco. A lot of promises without really, you know, like you've never walked into their building, you've never met with anybody. You talk to somebody at, at an event, and all of a sudden here comes an offer. That doesn't feel right, because when does that stop? They're promising you anything to get you in the building. At some point, that cuts off. Um, and a lot of hand-holding and just kind of talked her back to the edge. Um, and we figured for $10,000, would make her happy. <laughs> so it was really nothing, but it, again, just reassured her and made her think, it's not about the money, it's about the culture. I've been there, I know the kind of jobs I'm gonna be working on, I know the people I'm gonna be working with. And she really enjoyed everybody. So it's like, don't think about the money, think of all the other things. Um, so she's actually, uh, she again, called us up a couple weeks ago and said, I have an opportunity to go have um, an internship in Germany. We supported it. Hey, anything that's going to help you come back to the company with more experience, we'll delay your start date. So constantly just working with her, a lot of hand-holding. Um, but I'm not a big one for the phone, just because, again, they're millennials. <laughs> but I'll shoot an email, hey, you know what? It's, it's May already and warmer weather. It's hard to believe in a few weeks you'll be here um, interning with us or say, have you start your career with us? Anything to kind of do that and just touch base with them, warm and fuzzy. Um, I've read other companies that send care packages to college. Mm -hmm. I'm not mom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but anything that, you know, like, this is one of 
our, our prized um, trash keys is a cell phone power bank. Mm -hmm. At career fairs, people will pass up pens and rulers and stuff like that, but I have other vendors, other companies come to safety. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, colleges, yeah, there, anything tech. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I was actually at one job here at Manhattan College, and there was a company across from us that had ping pong balls. I'm like, well, that's silly. And they're like, hello, beer pong. Kind of tapping into all that. Um, <laughs> and as far as retaining, our staff engineers, once they come in and still find hire, they go through a two-year rotation program. So they go through a rotation program. Joanne, you said that battery charging after I got charged. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, and people um, the job here so we go to the future and they're like, oh, yeah, hey, you're the one with the cell phone charge. Do you have any extra? And we give them that to whoever wants them. If the more that we can get into people's hands, I mean, it has our name on it, yeah. mm -hmm. absolutely. So, um, but again, we have a um, rotation program. The staff engineers, you know, a lot of them are, you know, undergraduates. They want, they start talking about going back to grad school. We're like, wait, you spent all that time in school? Get your hands on experience. Mm -hmm. Come work with us for two years. Rotate through our different divisions. And then we have tuition reimbursement. We'll support you. Mm -hmm. But just find out what you want to do. So, Joanne, I'm hearing an emotional appeal. We're <laughs> <laughs> emotionally to your candidates. So I'm, I'm a firm believer in doing that as well. Mm -hmm. But it's definitely a way to pull them in. Like, oh, they care about me. Yes. Someone cares. And we know millennials definitely look to someone to pat them on the head, lead them along, yeah. and tell them what to do, when to do it, how to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of like inmates. <laughs> 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 They're looking to, you know, boomers and Gen X. Well, they, they struggle with Gen Xers. Because Gen Xers are like, come on, be independent, dude, make it work. Um, but the reality of the situation is when you're doing the emotional appeal to this group, it works tremendously well. Yeah. It really does. Did she come with your company, Joanne? Yes. Oh. She is um, slotted to start July 20th. Oh, great. Yes. Okay, we are at 3.49. I cannot believe like, how fast these three hours actually went, right? Um, so we're going to have to turn this into an annual party. So employers who are here, you've got to host this next year to stop. Um, <laughs> Before we leave, I really want to make sure, I, I, there's a few more cards, but I want to make sure that, you know, you took the time out to join us. I want to make sure that the question that you wanted to have answered today was answered. So I'm going to go around this side. Anything you want to ask? Yeah. Everybody got what they answered, but you wanted to know. Oh, no? Okay. I have one question. How many of you are, um, somebody brought it up earlier, responses website? Smartphones and things. How many of you have come up with apps for your company that people can download, students can download? To, to apply and see job posts? Yeah. Like that. That just, uh, we have one click, one click apply, which is basically like a mobile friendly website for candidates to go to see a job and they apply and it only really, I think it just gives them basic contact information and like a snapshot of employment history and then a full resume. The thing is that they integrated this into our experience hires team where you would think that campus would be the first place to go to sheer volume. Um, the feedback from that has that is, is been, from a recruiter standpoint, it's been really frustrating because you're missing a lot of key pieces of information and you almost have to jump to conclusions before you even call the candidate. So I think they're re-engaging that by vertical and might change it. I like the idea of having an application for your company for the constant uh, like, uh, jobs being posted like that. It's a good idea. I mean, that's something that I need to think about. Someone asked, um, how is, let me say it another way, what is the best way to engage employees in being a part of a new diversity initiative? So that sounds like more from an internal process within an organization on the road, it, so it must be um, getting your counterparts and teammates to help you with your diversity initiative. All the monitors. Yeah, all the monitors are the first easy go-to. Everybody wants to go back home. Everybody wants to go back home. They do. It's funny. So I worked for an organization at one point in my college recruiting career where college hiring, diversity hires, all of that was tied to a VP's overall objectives. 
So in order to ensure that they actually <coughs> accomplish the goal for the division of their business, they had, it was actually tied to their objectives. It literally was one of the objectives, and I can guarantee you when a VP sees that in their, or a director sees it, they're going to come to me and go, Cassandra, hey, this is one of my objectives, I think I can achieve this, but now I need to work with you to figure that out. So that's definitely been a direct hit. Anytime you need to engage somebody and they see it's part of what they have to accomplish in order for them to get their bonus and their stiff or whatever you call it at your company, um, they usually do it pretty quickly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very yeah. mm -hmm. So is it like kind of getting like a sponsor from a VC level? So everyone wants a sponsor as <laughs> part of their objectives. Like, what do I need to do? What team do I need to sit on? Do I need to start a team? What do I do? I need to write a check? Whatever it takes for me to get my money, <laughs> let's do it. So um, those are usually my easiest participants. I mean, historically, they've been my easiest participants. I haven't had that experience because I'm not actually recruiting here at Verizon. Um, I'm still attached to camps recruiting. Um, so yeah, they will find you all, they'll, they'll make their whole division go out and campus recruit if necessary in order for them to hit that target. So I'm not trying to answer the question, but literally it can take all, all forms because now all of a sudden they've got some skin in this game legitimately and they have to do that. The other thing I would also say is tapping into your employee resource groups. Yep. Uh, so several times, if, especially um, a lot of our ERGs here, they're, they're local. So they're, we have like our Mid-Atlantic, like our Hispanic support organization. So when I have an event with some of the Hispanic organizations, student organizations on campus, I'm going to probably go to the HSO and the shop and be like, hey, anyone who needs to volunteer uh, for any kind of, would like to participate in an event, whether it's a, you know, a career fair, whether it's we're doing an information session on campus, whether the organization is looking for mentors and our members, our employees that are part of BRG's mentor already as it is given their community service pillar of the organization. Uh, so whether, and we, we have 10 ERGs here, so every angle we can tap into, we will definitely leverage that as well. It's finding a diverse employee to be, one, to be more involved. So it's not, we're not begging you to, it's your, your choice to come on board, but you need to, we do make sure that whoever does come on with us, that they're on a uh, good performance rate, we, don't, we want to make sure we still have the right folks on campus, and they have support from their manager to be out of the office to look for those events. So we've been, we've been asked, oh, does HR pay for our travel? No, we do not. You, the business <laughs> asks us about your travel expenses. If you'd like to participate, you do still need to get approval from your manager. But that is how we get them engaged as well. And they actually, a lot of them try adding that into their performance treatment for the end of the year with their own manager. So it, it's, a, it's a great experience either way. So we leverage ERGs a lot. Piggybacking off of that, just just by getting our employees more engaged and going on campus, it, uh, they may not have ever had an intern. And I taught these students for the event for a couple hours and they come back, we want interns. And our program has been growing because of the fact that we're, we're leveraging our, our involvement out of our own team, putting in more onus on the business and it's helping it grow. Because we're relatively young. I think our program has really been documented only for a couple of years now. Yeah. At an enterprise level, certainly, and our, and we also do leverage our own college hires. <laughs> uh, we've been made, we've been tracking our college hires officially since I would say 2011, where we have our what well, we launched our VLDP yeah. program. So any that came post 2011, we know who they are, and we know where they're where they're working now, post program, and then our campus director and field level hires know where they are, where they've interned in the past, so we leverage them every chance we get. And a lot of them actually, when they get hired, they ask, how can I get involved in the recruitment process? I want to give back. So we know that we have those schools that uh, are recent college hires to help out with those initiatives on campus as well, in addition to our managers. And I think especially if you're having like an information <coughs> on campus, you want to have a diverse group of folks representing your organization. So you want entry, you want mid-level, and you also want senior. Uh, so it's making sure you know who those folks are and just having dialogue with them, like the directors and saying, hey, we're going to be at Rutgers or Penn State, if you're a Penn State alum, would you like to come? If so, what kind of events would you be, be more preferable for you? How much time would we need to give you? Like, get on your calendar. So if you give them, have that conversation with those individuals ahead of time and know what is preferable for them, then you'll certainly get their buy-in and have them accept with you. That's great. Wow, you're always 47. <laughs>
Um, that really kind of um, wraps up our day. I think we could probably have added on like another hour. I don't know. <laughs> we'll think about this in the future. Um, I want to thank all of you for coming out. We will be doing some other college recruiting boot camps. Um, just, you know, we already have colleagues in other locations, but we're going to be doing one in Boulder, Colorado in August around cybersecurity. We're doing one in San Francisco in September around LGBT uh, recruiting, looking at some other university recruiting events in Atlanta and some other locations. Um, there is actually just both their YouTube webinars, and there is going to be a diversity webinar series coming up mm -hmm. in um, September, and it's the honest diversity conversation. Mm -hmm. Really kind of like stuff that you know what's going on, and but you are afraid to speak it. Um, it's kind of like one of those, and our webinars are really kind of TED Talks, so it's like 15, 20 minutes, um, but I certainly encourage you, check out our emails, you know what I mean? We'll be sending you emails about different events that are going on. Again, I am going to follow up uh, with an email to all you guys who have an attachment and an attendee list, some links to some various resources, right? Um, based upon the conversations that we had, College Recruiter has a really great thing um, to help with like around diversity and recruiting that I think you guys will really enjoy. So again, I'm not going to pick up the code, but I'm really <laughs> Okay, so I'm just going to include it in my email, okay? Um, again, um, just thank all of you for coming. Those who joined us virtually, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Verizon, for opening up your home to allow us to come. Um, to all of you, I hope you'll come back to my party. Um, it was great having you guys. And stay in touch with me. And we're going to be at the hour. We're going to end on time. So again, thank you for joining us. Thank you. As you exit, if you want to recycle your lanyards, just leave them or drop them at the table. Um, toss them in the air like a graduation cap, you know. Just don't put someone's eye out because then it won't be funny.